home citizenship law and the politics of the poor. It's always a great pleasure when one of your colleagues um, gets um, our research published. Um, and uh, I'm very happy to uh, uh, be part of this um, launch event on, and grateful to the Vice Chancellor of the University, uh, Professor Rajkumar, for taking some time off uh, and an amazingly hectic schedule that you must have. I mean, I, when I think that my schedule is hectic, I then have to say, here is a gentleman who uh, manages the university, 12 schools, and uh, a whole lot of other activities related to administration, construction, and whatnot. Um, so I just marvel um, at uh, Professor Rajkumar's energy and, and his, uh, despite all that, to, to accord importance to um, an event like this when a colleague's work is uh, noticed, uh, critiqued, celebrated, um, and to be with us uh, this afternoon. Um, I'm very happy that uh, Dr. Christine Bershur is with us. Um, she was um, Kaveri's uh, supervisor uh, when she did this dissertation at the Graduate Institute for International and Development Studies in Geneva. And Kaveri says that uh, Christine was the dream guide to have. She introduced me to anthropology. Kaveri originally graduated in law from, the, from Bangalore and um, turned to ethnography and anthropology thanks to Christine Vershu's guidance. And she says she was so passionate about my research that she even followed me to India um, on my field work. So, um, so thank you very much, uh, uh, Dr. Vershu, for joining us. I'm delighted to have um, Isabel Guerin. She's a senior research fellow at the French National um, Research Institute for Sustainable Development. Um, who's uh, also been at the Institute in uh, Pondicherry, specializes in um, South India and um, on, uh, on, uh, on um, how weather, weather and in what conditions markets might be emancipatory um, for people living under severe conditions of uh, discrimination and uh, deprivation. So, and... Um, Finally, I'm absolutely delighted to that uh, uh, Professor Arjun Sengupta has joined us. I have to say that I, 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 I know I must have met him in 1987. There Arjun about, Appadura is Yes, Arjun Appadura, yes. Um, the, the, other, the other Arjun. No, you, 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 may, you said Arjun Sengupta, I think, by mistake. Oh, no, did I? Oh, gosh, okay. Um, no, we were, we were together um, at... Um, you, when Sorry, I a uh, little interruption yeah. at my door, but that's fine. Uh, no, no, Arjun, we, we, I, I, I was working in the Ford Foundation, and we put together a, 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 an issue on India called Another India by the uh, American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and had a meeting uh, that Stephen Graybard was then the editor uh, organized in uh, in Cambridge. And that's when um, I, I met uh, Professor Apadu, right? Um, I've known his work. Uh, more, more recently, uh, I note, you know, the references that you have in your book to his work, um, I have a connection with that as well. Because Jokin Arpudam, uh, who, was, um, who passed away, was the uh, General Secretary of the National Slum Dwellers Federation and also the President of the International Slum and Shack Dwellers Association came from Kolar Gold Fields, my hometown. So I knew Jokin Arpudam's um, family um, in KGF and, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and I worked with him and with Srirata Bhatliwala and um, in uh, Sheila Patel um, in uh, Mumbai um, when there was Spark, the NSDF and the Mahila Milan um, were very active um, working with the municipality and his article to which you make references um, related to deep democracy, um, pointing out that, you know, um, it's, it's a bit, you know, the irony of confining democracy to national institutions within national boundaries. Um, when you think of the very concept, you know, it's about people and must be transboundary. Um, so, you know, and he opens up a whole field um, of, uh, 
discovery that uh, you know many other scholars will have to take up um, related to uh, democracy with this uh, very seminal um, article. So I'm I'm absolutely thrilled, and I hope uh, that all of you here, I, some of you have visited uh, the campus, uh, Kaveri, if I'm not wrong, when you did this conference on uh, solidarity economy. Um, uh, and uh, Professor Padure has to has to join us uh, as soon as uh, possible when the students are there, the soul of the campus. And I'm also happy to welcome uh, Kriti Agarwal from uh, the General School of Art and Architecture. This is what I love, um, you know, kind of connections across schools, across disciplines. Um, Kaveri's book is um, interdisciplinary um, in a significant sense. Um, and uh, I, um, of course, I mentioned that uh, the Vice Chancellor sparing time for us is a great honor to all of us. So I, um, uh, having done my welcome to all of you uh, and to the audience, I hope all our faculty and students, many of them are listening live on the um, streaming service of our university. Uh, welcome to all of you and over to you, um, uh, Raj, for um, you know, actually launching the book by holding it up, maybe, I don't know, uh, like ship, uh, you know, which are, books are easily launched. Um, Great. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Dean Sudarshan. And I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of you to this uh, very important um, event in the university's calendar. And uh, I know that uh, uh, Kaveri has been working on this book for a very long time. And uh, uh, we've had occasions to uh, have have her present some of the ideas of the book in the course of the last couple of years. And, uh, you know, for any scholar, the outcome of one's hard work and, uh, uh, you know, very scrupulous um, effort and also uh, work of this magnitude, which requires a lot of field work, uh, coming to its uh, logical conclusion in the form of a book is a defining moment. I want to extend a warm welcome to our very distinguished guest speakers, Dr. Arjun Apadurai, Dr. Christine Vershashur, Dr. Veronica Dupont, Dr. Isabel Gurin, uh, thank you very much for being here. Uh, you know, in fact, it's wonderful to uh, you know have all of you be part of this uh, launch. Thank you, Sudarshan, for encouraging your faculty members to pursue this. I also want to recognize the presence of my other distinguished uh, colleague, Professor Kirti Agarwal. I'm sure some of you know that Kirti's work is also on. Uh, understanding and appreciating the role of uh, cities and urban poor and to what extent inclusive neighborhoods uh, can, uh, the, the intersection of architecture and urban space is an important aspect uh, that we pay little attention to. So thank you very much for, uh, you know, being part of this program. Uh, what I thought I will quickly do is, Kaveri, uh, in a way, the book, uh, which um, I had the privilege to browse through, I don't think I've read the whole thing, uh, it's one of those books where uh, it is a classic interdisciplinary work that doesn't happen enough uh, in our country, but also in other parts of the world. And most of the time, the reason such work doesn't happen is that scholars are generally uh, comfortable within their own specialized areas of interest and don't do enough to move beyond the comfort zone and the frontiers of their own disciplinary boundaries. Uh, and in your case, I think you are indeed gifted uh, with the fact that you moved out of law uh, and early on, and you had the privilege to have, uh, to appreciate the limitations of law, the limits of law, and to be able to recognize that how law can uh, essentially play a more empowering role, and at times even a disempowering uh, role when it comes to uh, citizenship uh, and indeed, uh, what you talk about the politics of the poor. It's also uh, deeply disturbing uh, in relation to the book in terms of how, uh, I mean, I can, I, can, I can refer to another book by uh, Harsh Manda, uh, which was published uh, relatively recently, when he talks about the numbing effect of uh, most of us, uh, where we no longer uh, you know, take uh, into account uh, the poor in any form, and it's no longer uh, an aspect of serious intervention uh, when it comes to the plight of the poor. Uh, I would like to also draw your attention to a, a, a very deeply disturbing movie that I recently watched. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a Tamil movie, 
but also now available in other languages called J Beam. Uh, the again the movie is the protagonist is a uh, is a lawyer, but then you know the whole movie is about the plight of the disadvantaged, the marginal, the vulnerable, and indeed the disempowered. And uh, we can't even fathom uh, the kind of uh, let's say victimization that happens uh, to these people at the margins so in a way i am very happy that uh, uh, you know kaveri took this effort to first identify a theme of this kind uh, did painstaking research uh, and spent a lot of time uh, because uh, uh, you know as as a vice chancellor of a university i exhort my colleagues to produce a, a a large number of scopus publications in a relatively short span of time and uh, uh, and when i see books like this i also recognize that uh, uh, you know uh, limitations of uh, doing such research uh, does uh, you know uh, take more time than what uh, let's say a, a journal article uh, that is uh, published in a leading journal would take so i encourage uh, uh, kaveri to continue her work in this manner Uh, i also want to say that uh, uh, in a way uh, interdisciplinary universities such as ours interdisciplinary schools such as the jindal school of government and public policy ought to be pursuing such research because uh, at the policy and governance level uh, the disciplinary boundaries uh, are do not exist and most of the time uh, we are dealing with issues that are that require many people from different disciplines coming together and recognizing both the strengths and the limitations of their own disciplines when it comes to effecting uh, any form of uh, social political or economic change uh, once again uh, congratulations to you kaveri for your uh, uh, effort and indeed your work uh, i think uh, the beautiful endorsements given by distinguished scholars uh, at the back of the book uh, Uh, only reinforces uh, the intellectual rigor uh, that has been pursued through this book and i only hope that uh, we will have opportunities to engage with the policy makers about some of the findings of the book so that uh, at real level at the at the at the grassroots level there is also possible impact to your work uh, congratulations and i am very delighted to be here and i also want to thank our very distinguished scholars from different parts of the world who have uh, accepted uh, to be here and i also want to thank uh, uh, kirti for uh, moderating the discussion that is going to happen uh, uh, shortly thank you very much uh, thank thank you thank you um, raj um, i'm i'm delighted that uh, uh, veronique uh, dupont um, has been able to join us i mean we when we started we missed her um, many of you know her well um, she's um, Uh, been a senior research fellow at the French Research Institute for Sustainable Development. Um, she spent time in New Delhi as the director of the Center for Social Sciences and Humanities, um, and knows uh, uh, Delhi well. But she knows um, India very well, and um, and she's uh, worked on um, on uh, socio spatial transformation of uh, Indian metropolitan cities. Uh, focusing on urban uh, policies and um, how um, people cope um, with uh, uh, with you know shelter, um, living in slums, evictions, um, the kinds of stuff that uh, um, Kaveri deals with in her book, uh, focused on a, a slum rehabilitation locality in Bangalore. So we you know we've got. it's not just a, a book launch i'd say that this um, uh, event serves as a very substantive uh, seminar in itself on this theme um, of um, um, how do people cope um, with the, with the state with the government with law um, with um, with um, our bureaucracy um the documents that define um lives of people um all of that um comes together so i look forward to handing over to the uh, kriti for uh, moderating what is going to be more uh, well beyond just a book launch um to celebrate um kaveri's publication with the cambridge university press 
um, this is a recording of this event will be a substantial contribution to knowledge in itself. Um, I'm sure thanks to the distinguished panelists that we have. So over to you, Preeti. Kaveri, I hope I did the so-called, uh, I mean, the e-launch uh, of the book. I, I, is there, is there yeah, let's have a screen screen screen. Screen. Yeah, just, I, I must say, um, uh, Professor Rajkumar, without the enabling uh, environment that you have provided us at JGU, this would not have been possible. I started writing this book when I started working in JGU. So I have you and Dean Sudarshan uh, for the excellent leadership and uh, the flexibility that you provide us, which gives us a lot of time to be able to come out with quality research. Thank you very much. Thanks. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, uh, Professor Sudarshan. Thank you, Professor Rajkumar. A very warm welcome, everyone, our distinguished scholars, our speakers, as well as our colleagues and students who are joining us on YouTube. A very warm welcome. First of all, Kaveri, congratulations on the book. And uh, I'm delighted to be here to celebrate its launch and be a part of this discussion. Um, I corrected with Kaveri when she presented the gender chapter of the book as part of the Feminist Economics and Policy Initiative. And it was very interesting how it resonated with my work in the slums of Delhi, though she was presenting Bangalore and I have been working in Delhi. And it resonated because the policies, the national policies which guide provision of shelter and housing and access to services, it's, uh, those are the same, which apply to Delhi as well as Bangalore, as well as the feminist critique of the right to city. So it resonated with me. And the biggest takeaway I had, because when I was working in slums and going by the conventional definition of slums, uh, I was working in urbanized villages, quarter settlements, as well as resettlement colonies. So I was using this term slum very broadly. And I remember Kaveri noted it and she clarified that, you know, my book is focused on the issues of citizenship for rehabilitation projects. And that's where the distinction comes in. So the citizenship in itself. And to me, that was the point I knew that this is serious work by a very genuine and meticulous researcher. And I'm delighted, Kaveri, that you invited me here. So thank you so much for that. Um, it's, it's very difficult to find such work even today. And I guess we are lucky at JGU, of course. But uh, this idea of right to the city is something that I have been working on and we unpack in, during, in my classes as well, of course, in the School of Architecture. And we discuss the right to the city. And when we start, the students are asked, whose right, which right are, or rights are we talking about and in which city? And Kaveri's book, The In Search of House, is located, it discusses this aspect of the right to shelter for people, for the poor who are evicted and they're relocated to the periphery of the city of Bangalore in the southwest ward of Lagere. I'm sorry if I mispronounced it, but Lagere and Lagere. And um, it discusses the aspects of, you know, the the concept of marginalization, which is spatial, social, and economic, and this the struggle to access basic amenities, the gender roles, the politics of emotions, and it all simply comes down to the right to live with dignity and respect. And it represents a failure of urban planning in India, which has created this problem and we continue to struggle with it. And as an architect urban designer, I would say I'm part of the problem and I'm trying to fix it on my own. So I will not take more time and I would now like to welcome our first speaker, Dr. Arjun Apadurai. He's a Paulette Goddard Professor of Media at New York University. Professor Apadurai is a renowned cultural anthropologist known for his work on culture and globalization, as well as reflections on the politics of the poor. Uh, Professor, over to you, a very warm welcome. The floor is yours. Uh, oh, thank sorry. you very much. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, no, no, should sorry. I proceed? Just, yeah. Yeah, I, I just forgot to mention note. we get 10 minutes every speaker as per exactly. the schedule. Exactly, so I'm noting the time, which is your time, 9.51. So 
or perhaps few seconds before I will finish. Uh, so I want to thank uh, all of you, uh, including uh, the vice chancellor, whom I have not met uh, before, I don't think, uh, but uh, also Dean Sudarshan, whom I have met, uh, as he uh, generously recalled and have uh, followed his, uh, his movements uh, across various uh, parts of Asia to now uh, this uh, fascinating university where I have the pleasure of uh, knowing other uh, young scholars and colleagues in the law school and elsewhere, uh, some of whom might be present uh, today. Uh, I'm of course uh, also delighted to meet uh, my colleagues from Switzerland and France. Uh, I think I've perhaps met Christine before uh, in Geneva some while ago, courtesy of Shalini and mm -hmm. others. Uh, so that it's nice to renew our acquaintance. And of course, I know your work. Uh, likewise, I'm uh, happy that I've been a fellow traveler in some circles in France that have to do with uh, development uh, uh, in various ways. So therefore, uh, very also, uh, all this to say, I'm, I'm very honored and uh, delighted to be part of this uh, discussion. And I just say a few very brief things, uh, but I begin by saying, uh, I want to congratulate uh, Kaveri Haritas for a, a quite a remarkable book, uh, which if you examine the bibliographies or references in each chapter, you will see is not an uncrowded field. <laughs> We have quite a few studies of this kind of phenomenon now from uh, quite a number of Indian cities over time, over 15 years. So it's not uh, uh, Calcutta, Bangalore, uh, Bombay, Delhi, and more. Now smaller metros, the more and more work. So it's a very crowded space. And uh, I'm not even counting the work from other parts of the world, from Latin America, and all of which he also cites. So the short point is that it's not easy <laughs> to say something new or uh, striking. And there are two ways to do it and she does both. One is very meticulous, uh, to use uh, Kriti's phrase, very meticulous uh, empirical description. Uh, you simply learn new things at that level. And it doesn't matter whether you know Delhi or Bombay or Pune or even Bangalore, <laughs> you will learn something at that level and quite a lot. And the second is the angle. So of course, uh, you know, in academia these days, we, we always want some kind of theory, comparison, generalization. It's not enough as it used to be in the old days, like a government report to add, you know, thousands of new factual things. That's very important. But the other thing is also very important. And there she does an excellent job. And I just want to quickly say that for me, the broad way to put the conceptual connection she makes, which are not easy to make in a field which is still somewhat polarized between, let's say, cultural, ethnographic, anthropological accounts, and uh, uh, let's call them political economy accounts with law tending towards the one side, and then design and architecture and planning being yet in a third space. So these are not easy things to connect. Uh, many people will gesture this way and that, but it's hard to do. And she does it, so it's a it's a big it's a big thing. Um, and the main uh, conceptual issue there is a very old one in the social sciences, which is how do you combine? One way to put it is micro and macro, the state, big policies with very small details of people's ordinary lives. The other way to put it is, how do you combine political economy understandings with cultural, ethnographic, everyday? Uh, understandings of how people live, make meaning, and get from today to tomorrow. That is the anthropologist's question. Rarely are these two put in the same lens. This book does so. So I'm, uh, I think these are already sufficient reasons to say it's a wonderful book. I'll just make a few more smaller specific comments. One which struck me, even as we were talking today, is to note that the key word uh, for rights, there are many other words in the book, important words from Canada and so on, is uh, hakka, 
Uh, Hakka, you'll notice, is from Kannada, but it comes from Hak. And Hak is not a Sanskrit in the Hindu term. It has a provenience, and the provenience is the Islamic word. So I brought your attention that the central word pertaining to rights in this context or any other context in India comes from the Islamic world. I leave you to ponder that single point, but it can be made about many other things in the book. But the Huck point to me is striking that without this, where is the whole discussion of rights for ordinary people? Of course, in the English language, legal stuff and constitution and so on, we can talk of rights. But the minute you come to ordinary life, from Tamil Nadu up to Kashmir, this other word is very important. Though in some places like Tamil Nadu, you have some other words, Urimai and so on. But Huck is used very frequently. And in Kannada, it is this word. So this kind of observation is, is I think, important for us to think about. Um, I think, in addition, I'll just say uh, one or two uh, small things. Uh, which I enjoyed and appreciated uh, in the book. And in the main, I uh, was very taken with the bringing in of themes like uh, gender and uh, the life of paper, on which there is a very rich literature about files and writing documents, which I also have noticed uh, in India and others have too, but it's brought in beautifully into the chapter on paper and documents as part of the way in which uh, the people in rehab housing, who are of course a certain branch or subsection of the urban poor, not everyone is in rehab housing, uh, still they how they actually uh, take risks, let's put it this way, with entering the world of bureaucratic documentation because that world has a sucking sound in it towards the state. But they're also sucking in the opposite direction. They're using those things to say, we have this right, we are here already, we can show you, we can self-survey, et cetera. So there is a, a, a very complex two-way uh, business going on there. And paper, the life of paper, the life of files, the life of documents, the life of seals, chops, all those things is a big, big topic on which some people have written a little bit in South Asia, but is worthy of uh, considerably more examination. And we get that very richly here today. The other thing I also enjoyed, particularly and especially, was the discussion of the role of women uh, in this uh, world. Uh, and I'll say something about how I see this world in a moment, which goes to the main argument, but I'll simply say that bringing in the idea of gender in connection to performativity, the idea made famous by Judith Butler, but the truth is Judith Butler talked about a very esoteric category of people. That is people in the queer world 25 years ago in the most privileged cities in the world. So that's not a huge demographic. So to take the idea of performativity into a space like this is already a very radical thing to do because it tells you that it's of very general value and that also uh, politics has a performance aspect. And the performance aspect is both public theater, what you can do out there, but it is also very crucial to law itself. I have written elsewhere in some work on finance and so on, that the key to the contract, and contract is fundamental to law, is performativity. I promise if you do this, I'll do that. That is contract, end of story. It is performative at its heart. So performativity going way beyond gender theory and all is crucial to modern law and well worth studying. So these are all ways in which Kaveh's book has made me think a lot. But above all, I would say it, uh, makes a compelling case uh, for what she calls citizenship in limbo. Now, there are a lot of surrounding words here, partial citizenship, fragile citizenship, citizenship in the making. It's an endless list. Uh, almost everyone working in this space has added some word. But the limbo word, I think, for her in this book captures uh, a state of uh, uncertainty 
incompleteness, also a kind of uh, tightrope. It's very risky. Uh, limbo is not a safe state. Um, and to me, it catches the central strength of the book, which is to show us that the urban poor, uh, and particularly this category, but I think it's true of all urban poor, all urban poor of the, of the poorest, uh, let's put it that way, that they're all on a tightrope. And the tightrope, one end is in the hands of the state, one end is somewhere else, but they are somewhere constantly standing on that and trying to make their way. And I think this is a great, this book is a great glimpse both of the policies and the theories, but also the lived experience of that kind of precarity or uh, citizenship in limbo. And I'll stop there. Thanks very much. Thank you, Professor Apagure. And thank you for sticking to the time. Uh, our next speaker, uh, I'd like to invite Dr. Christine Vershur who's a retired senior lecturer from the Graduate Institute of International and Development Studies, Geneva. She's an anthropologist interested in gender, social reproduction, and the economy. Doctor, over to you. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Kaveri, for having invited me to this uh, event. I'm so proud of you uh, and so happy for you. I, I, I can't say how how much I enjoyed this moment. Um, yes, we know each other since I, I, I checked in my mails. I found the first mail we exchanged was in two, early 2007. So it's almost, almost 15 years ago that we know each other and uh, have been working each other. And it's for me a very um, a special moment also that uh, um, now, we have changed um, the sort of relationships we have because first you were my student and now you are my colleague. So it's also uh, very important for me to know, to, to follow that long story with you and to see that we continue exchanging and working together. Um, I must say also that I'm very admirative of, uh, of this work, of this book that uh, everybody has shown already. Um, uh, it's, it represents an enormous long work. It's based on such a long uh, duration of research in this field that I think it's very exceptional in that sense. Somebody who has done such a long research in, in a field and, and can make us make us feel how 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 well she, she feels how uh, how intensively close she is to that field and that i think that is reflected in the book uh, and that makes the book also very rich um, this mixture of a very strong theories that you develop and very concisely and very clearly with a mixture of different disciplines, which has already been mentioned, but is really forces the admiration because you came from legal studies, but you really have an anthropological approach, and you 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 have included that in the in the writing of this book. This uh, the, the 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 vignettes that you show, the description of the field, makes us really feel as if we were there, and. Um, I, since I was there once, I can I could feel again, really the field and the and the uh, environment and this what you say one of the, your strong uh, theoretical contributions I think uh, uh, which was just mentioned is the citizenship in limbo this state of uncertainty which is very difficult to to live with and still these women live in this situation and continue struggling and continue uh, learning the, the state, as you say also, inspired I think by other colleagues like Kalpana um, and trying to um, continue the, the work. So I, I wanted to say a, a few things because I can't uh, go in depth on everything. The book is very rich. But the, the first thing I wanted to mention also is, and one of the things I appreciated a lot, is the, the quality of writing. I thought uh, this is very important for a book if you want to read it until the end to, to have this, uh, this 
very nice and rich and 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 fine way of of um, of writing going between theory and um, uh, empirical word work uh, making us feel as if we would be accompanying you in your reflections in the way you um, deepen your theor theoretical reflections but without losing sight of the people with whom you are exchanging. And we really feel that very strongly. I think that's a, 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 an incredible strength of their, your book, this, uh, this going from theory to empirical words, showing us the, the, the words, uh, sh sharing with us the words and the lives of the people with you, whom you have shared so many years, because you have become very close to some of these of these people. I think this is very one of the strengths of your books. Um, and even if you another strength is also that um, even if you are um, you 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 show us that you have some empathy with these people, you still are able to maintain that distance that is necessary to try to reflect and in de uh, go deep in, into reflect uh, theoretical studies and make contributions also to other places in the world. And indeed your references to, to, to Sao Paulo and Brazil or other, other places is, is extremely important. This in the possibility that your book contributes to, to reflections in other places of the world is really very important. Um, so the, the, the first thing I wanted to say is that my, my, my uh, admiration for your huge work, it has been a long work from a master thesis to a PhD manuscript and to this book. And uh, I, I know it has not been easy. You have been going through a lot of difficulties also because as a woman researcher, it's never so easy. We know that uh, there are other constraints that uh, particular constraints that that are do you had to face and uh, I admire you a lot for your strength and your struggle through all that 15 year old <laughs> long work to come to that to that book of course I know you have done a lot of other publications which are important but this one is really a marker I think that uh, that you want to underline um, I think it's worth also mentioning that you I have uh, in a very concise way and and uh, which is managed to to um, to resume to to resume in French to put together a lot of theoretical work that has been done on these issues as just it was just mentioned it is an issue that has been very much work, so it's not easy to try to do something original and new and concise. And you have been able to do that, and putting forward new concepts and uh, and uh, that are very important. I think it has already been mentioned. Mentioned the citizenship in limbo. I think this this uh, concept is very important and and reflects very well the It's it's at the same time very theoretically deep and and very close to the the way the the people live their situation and and uh, it, it it you show there really this uh, intertwining between uh, your law background and your ethnographical background i think it's it's very beautifully mentioned and and it reflects really very well what you what what you want to say with that, and which is I think so important, and and we I remember we discussed that a lot when we were on the field. This state of uncertainty, this state of of so difficult relations with the state, with this complexity, with this incredible messy situation of so many uh, in, uh, organizations, uh, institutions that uh, the people, the women in particular, have to deal with to try to survive in this situation. But you have other concepts like the, word, the way you work on the margins, uh, the brokers, I just mentioned them, but I think the, 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 it's worth on it, all of these concepts, you say very interesting things, even on corruption also, um, on emotions, of course, it has been mentioned already, which is uh, inseparable of, of this uh, 
citizenship in limbo and of the situation of the poorest of the poorest, because we are really talking about the most marginalized in this peripheral periphery of Bangalore. Um, also, this um, the the social life of papers that it, it, it's uh, an incredibly interesting aspect also that has been worked by others, but it's it's really, you give it new uh, new meanings and, and a very concrete also, which I, I, I appreciate a lot that you go really concrete to show how this social life of, of, of papers or documents is important and influences the life of, impacts the life of the people. And uh, I wanted also to go mention this. Um, you maybe you it's not a very you don't work s uh, more extensively on it, but you mention it very concisely and very uh, um, importantly. The 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 way Haku I don't know if I pronounce it well uh, Haku uh, the, this the perception of rights uh, how these these courses on right travel from at different uh, levels from the lo local neighborhood level to the, 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 the local state level, municipal level to, uh, to the international level also. And I think that's also maybe a uh, piste de recherche I, um, for, to, to, to go on and work more on that because I think that's a, a very promising way of uh, uh, um, piste de recherche in, in, in French. Um, one of the, uh, very, because I'm a, a feminist scholar and work mostly, I have work, worked a lot on, on, on urban issues, but um, um, namely with a feminist perspective. And I think what uh, one of the really rich contributions that you show very vividly is that um, these, the, the work the, um, that um, these women in these neighborhoods do is political work. I think that's a major contribution. Um, it makes me think of this uh, uh, sentence of uh, Federici that everyday struggles on private st uh, st uh, issues are political struggles. And you show that very clearly also that it is a political struggle, struggling for uh, water taps or for uh, uh, all these very private, so-called private issues are very political struggles. And uh, um, it makes this work of women very visible and very, and it shows the importance of this work for the, the survival, not only of their families, but of the, of the whole community that is there. And it brings us back to this discussion that we had on this um, research project where we have been working together as colleagues, not as my student, but as colleagues um, on the solidarity economy and social reproduction, because this, what you are discussing is really part of the organization of social reproduction. And, um, and you are uh, discussing here how this work is, uh, political work, and so you are entering this discussion on how to politicize the reproductive, uh, the social reproduction, which is key to eventually trans try to transform the system that reproduces these inequalities. So I think this is also a very important contribution that you make in 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 your work, and um, that is worth underlining. Um, finally, maybe if I would have um, uh, one question or two, I don't know, but if you have time later on to, dis to, see, to discuss that. Um, uh, you, the, the, the question would be to what extent are there possibilities of changes in the power relations at the household level, because clearly this is uh, uh, one very difficult issue in all parts of the world. It is one of the most difficult things to change, as we have seen also in the in the in the other book that we have published together. That um, 
I can show because I did a presentation yesterday and where you contributed with a, 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 a chapter also. This is one of the most difficult things to, 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 to change. And eventually that would eventually also be an, a piste de recherche. You, you talk of the, of the uh, incremental changes at the end of the book and, uh, and uh, which is uh, I think uh, also a very uh, important yeah, worth uh, deepening uh, more. You have, I think you have uh, interesting conclusions there. And I would wonder to what extent you think that eventually power relations at the family level, the household level could, uh, could, um, could be um, uh, a possibility or not. Um, and, um, and how that would eventually uh, contribute to alleviate uh, somehow the the burden of social reproduction and uh, make this political work of uh, of organizing the 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 search for home, as you say, a bit more uh, shared between uh, the different people, uh, be it in the household or even be between different groups that are living in this. Uh, in, in this neighborhood. Finally, just last word, because I liked this word, sentence so much that you said that you had some difficulties to, to when you, you started the book and you say something very nice, when you said, when I paid attention to the field, then the book took shape. And I, I like this, this very much because it shows, it's a, 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 an illustration of the way how you relate to your field and how do deep you feel you feel the field and how you are able to articulate theory and empirical work. And I think it's a good example for other students or scholars to never forget the field and stick to it and pay attention to the field and give the voices, share the voices of the people with whom you are working on the field. And um, well, I'm so happy that this book is now out. It's the end of a very long journey and the beginning of many, many more uh, works on these issues, I, I hope. And um, I'm, I'm just hoping that we will meet again soon in some place so that we can celebrate that personally also, Kaveri. Thank you, Dr. Vishul. Lots of points. Um, now, uh, I'd like to invite our next speaker, Dr. Veronique Dupont. She was a senior research fellow at the French National Research Institute for Sustainable Development in Paris. She's a well-known anth urban anthropologist, also associated with the Center for Human Sciences, Delhi, with an interest in urban governance. Dr. Dupont, over to you, welcome. Uh, thank you very much. So first, I would like to apologize for missing the, the start of this uh, book launch and this, uh, well, thanks to uh, interruption in the Parisian metro. So I have to, uh, well, to walk the last stretch to reach my office. And uh, so uh, good morning or good afternoon to everybody. And thanks a lot for inviting me to this very uh, stimulating uh, discussion. So at the outset, I would like to say how much I enjoy reading your book, Kaveri and also how much I got enriched by its reading as it resonates with uh, my own research work. So as I wrote in the endorsement, I think that uh, in, search of, uh, in Search of Home, it's really a fascinating account of everyday life and struggle uh, in the new ghettos of urban poverty. And this provides an alternative story to the high tech globalizing city of Bangalore but it is neither a miserability, uh, miserabilist portrait of slum dwellers display, displaced to uh, rehabilitation uh, housing on the city outskirts, nor a glorification of their resistance. Instead, it provides a nuanced understanding of the politics of the urban poor for full citizenship in their search of a secure home. And your, this study is based on a very detailed, well-documented, in-depth case study backed, as it was mentioned, by a long field engagement stretched over six years. 
and you manage to pull the threads from your in-depth um, follow-up interview with a rehabilitation housing quarter um, with 50 families to reach other places in the city. And the outcome of this study proves the value of a fine grain analysis relying on extensive fieldwork to understand complex issues and avoid also a simplistic interpretation and theorization. Thus, it is a brilliant demonstration of how a longitudinal and reflexive micro-level ethnography can illuminate citywide processes and furthermore enriches theoretical reflections and debates on the practice of citizenship, uh, informality and law, corruption and patronage, uh, resistance and power, and much more. For example, uh, your approach to citizenship challenges uh, the usual binaries of legal, illegal, of formal, informal, citizen, subject, revolutionary, passive, insider, outsider. And instead, you endorse uh, the notion of incremental uh, citizenship that you borrow from Vinadas and that I found particularly relevant. And uh, by drawing attention to the political work of women, as uh, the other speaker has uh, already underlined, you further challenge the private public dichotomy, which is usually attached to uh, political actions. And uh, your nuanced understanding of the politics of the urban poor allows you to highlight the heterogeneity and intricacy of the political society with reference to uh, Partha Chatterjee's concept. But uh, what I would like to say also is that the relevance of your study goes much beyond the case of Bangalore. And many of the practices and processes that you highlight in your research echo observations that I uh, carried out in Delhi resettlement colony, as well as in Chennai resettlement housing quarters. And I would like just to uh, to give a few examples to, uh, to underline the reach of your, of your study and the richness. First, the lack of basic urban uh, services at the time of settlement. This is a problem commonly observed in resettlement colonies in Delhi, Savda uh, Grevra, Narela, as well as in the resettlement flats in Chennai, especially in Kanaginagar, as some of you must uh, know. Then the issues around the list of households eligible for resettlement was equally, as you said, a, a source of immense anxieties. And this was also, uh, uh, I, I found the same type of anxiety uh, among the slum dwellers targeted by resettlement or in situ rehabilitation that I could interview in Delhi. And the practices of manipulation of the allotment or all lists were also found. And this is what try, what uh, gives, uh, what, uh, uh, well, engender this type of anxiety that even if you are by principle or according to the criteria entitled to uh, resettlement, unfortunately, it doesn't uh, always ensure that you will, uh, that you will have the, uh, you'll be allotted what. Uh, then, uh, an important issue also that you underline is the division of the urban poor in their competition for scarce resources, so here at home. And so you show that uh, in the Bangalore case study, and it's certainly a serious obstacle to the mobilization of the urban poor to defend their interests vis-a-vis -vis the urban authority. And this is also observed in other city. In Delhi and Bombay especially, the cutoff date of residence in the slum as a criteria of uh, uh, eligibility for resettlement or rehabilitation inevitably splits the slum community in two groups with different entitlements. Uh, and at the time of slum resettlement, the differentiation, another important differentiation is the differentiation between owners and tenants, and tenants which generates another important fracture as the latter are often not even considered during the surveys aimed at identif uh, identifying eligible households. Then the notion of margin that uh, uh, I think Arjun Apadurai and maybe Christine also underlined. You rightly argue that the poor uh, live in the margin, but both in geographical um, term, means they live on the urban periphery, they're often relegated to the urban periphery, but also they are uh, marginalized in terms of their relationship with the state. In your own words, 
they are also at the margin of, uh, of governance in that they rely far more on local politics and have no access to upper echelons of government. And this you make a reference to uh, Solomon uh, Benjamin. So I fully endorse this uh, approach in terms, I could say, uh, cumulative marginalities, which allows us to better understand the compound vulnerability and discrimination of urban slum dwellers. And including, and this is important, very important point to underline uh, that your study really shows, including after their uh, contingent resettlement. And to the two dimension of marginality that you uh, underline, geographical and vis-a-vis -vis the state, I would like at least to add another dimension of marginality which frequently affects the urban poor, uh, including after resettlement, namely the environmental or geophysical dimension. For example, location in a low-lying fluid prone area and in an urban context, Living in such locations means living on the margin of building land. In other words, beyond land meant for sustainable urbanization with dire consequences for the inhabitants. And this is the case not only of uh, uh, many squatter settlement, but also of some planned settlement uh, housing quarters. For example, Kanaginaga and Perambu uh, Perambakam in Chennai, or the resettlement colony of Madame Pocadar in Nelly were all located in low-lying area and hence prone to, uh, to, uh, to flood. But uh, as uh, uh, Christine and Arjun Napadurai, I was also particularly interested in the way you develop the concept of citizen in limbo. As you said, uh, citizen suspended between a slum-like life and desires for full citizenship and a secure home what you also aptly term the permanence of impermanence. And interestingly, the literature on camps highlights similar concept of permanent temporariness and state of suspension. For example, Picker and Paschetti conceptualize camp as, I quote, durable social special formations that displace and confine undesirable populations suspending them in a distinct, special, legal, and temporal conditions. So in my own study on the slum redevelopment project in Delhi, namely that of Katputli Colony, I found this conceptual framework quite relevant to analyze the effect of temporary resettlement in a transit camp, uh, the effect on the displaced family, that they've been awaiting their final rehabilitation for several years. In Bombay also, you find example of so-called transit camp where people have been living there for decades, sometimes waiting for their final rehabilitation. But one will not necessarily expect that this regime of permanent temporariness and suspension in the distinct spatial, legal and temporal condition will also apply to planned resettlement housing quarters. And this is where I think this is a very important contribution of your study to show that despite the implementation of resettlement policy for slum dwellers, the rehabilitation process remains incomplete in so far as the residents uh, of resettlement housing do not gain full citizenship. Uh, Finally, as a last comment, if I have two minutes, I would like to come back to the statement, to a statement that you made on judicial pronouncements in the introduction of, the, of your book. I quote, in effect, neither law nor judicial pronouncements have supported rehabilitation as a necessary measure in case of eviction. So here I would like to nuance this statement with reference to a judgment pronounced in February 2010 by the High Court of Delhi, the judge was, uh, uh, the Chief Justice was S. Muradida, and uh, a judgment which is considered as path breaking. This is the case referred to as Sudama um, Singh and other versus uh, government of Delhi and other, where the applicants were the inhabitants of demolished slum. And the High Court rejected the Delhi government and municipalities' argument that slum dwellers did not deserve to be relocated to alternative sites in resettlement colony when their jogis, mean shacks, occupied public road, thus violating the right of way. And interestingly, the court argued, I quote, 
Jogi dwellers are not to be treated as secondary citizens. They are entitled to no less an access to basic survival needs as any other citizen. It is the state constitutional and statutory obligation to ensure that if the Jogi dweller is forcibly evicted and relocated, such Jogi dweller is not worse off. The relocation has to be a meaningful exercise consistent with the right to life, livelihood, and dignity of such Jogi uh, dwellers. End of quote. So such judgment does rely on a conception of slum dwellers as full citizens protected by the Indian constitution. And uh, important, importantly, this judgment is referred to in the current resettlement and rehabilitation policy of the Delhi Urban Shelter Improvement Board. So my last question to open the discussion will be, in your opinion, do you think that such type of judgment and potential jurisprudence might impact positively slam resettlement and rehabilitation, and maybe more importantly, the way it will be implemented at the ground level. So I will, uh, I will end uh, here. And again, I well, said how much, uh, well, I really uh, enjoyed this reading and also congratulate you for this study. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Dupo. I would now like to invite our last speaker, Dr. Isabel Guerra, who's a senior research fellow at the French National Research Institute for Sustainable Development in Paris. She's an economic anthropologist with an interest in micro credit, debt, and finance. Uh, Dr. Guerra, over to you. You have 10 minutes. Thank you, and thank you so much to the uh, organizers at GHU for, for giving me the opportunity to say a few words about uh, Cabaret's book. It's, so I'm very happy to be here. It's a real privilege. I'm very happy to meet again Professor Sudarshan. I think you remember where we met a couple of years ago at Jeju. It was a real pleasure. I'm also very happy to have the privilege to, to, to meet Professor Padurai and, and Professor Rashkumar and also Professor Agarwal. And also to meet my old colleagues and friends, uh, Christine and uh, Veronique. Well, I, I already... I read uh, some of your papers, uh, Cavalli, but uh, this book is really fascinating. Um, I mean, many things have been said already. I'm not going to repeat everything, and, and I only have 10 minutes, so I, I, I'm going just to focus on a few things. I'm not at all a urban speci specialist. I learned so much about the so-called um, rehabilitation policies, no? and the, the, the making of urban infrastructure, and what you show very well is to what extent those infrastructure are, are the result of a constant, daily, uh, relentless, laborious effort of, 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 the urban, of the urban poor and, and, and in the very first place, women. And those infrastructure don't, don't come from the air. They are made by the, by the effort of those poor people and, and, and women in the first place. No? What I found um, Excellent. I, it has been said already, but I would say it again: is your ability to account for the extent of violence on the on the on the one hand, social violence, symbolic violence, physical violence, and at the same time, as Veronique just said, they're not reducing the poor to victims. Um, and and of course, this is uh, this has been a constant concern of social sciences, no, to find the right balance between these agency and structure and, and micro and micro. But it is easier said than done, and and I think you do it very well. And, and I think the way you combine what would be called the political and the, and the moral economies of the urban poor certainly help you to find the right balance between uh, this, this uh, micro, micro agency and, and structure. Um, what I also found is that, um, again, this has been said already, but far beyond uh, an ethnography bounded in time and space, uh, which is already great, uh, your book raises uh, a number of fundamental uh, conceptual uh, questions, which are valid well beyond India and, and well beyond the issue of urban poor. There are many of them, uh, but given the, the limited time, I, I will comment only on one. Um, and Christine has been talking about it already. Uh, Veronique also mentioned it quickly, uh, but I think it's so important that I'm going again to focus on this, this issue of political work. Um, well, an entire chapter is dedicated to this question, but it's also a guiding thread all along the book. Um, and uh, we already had the opportunity to discuss about it, Kavri. Uh, but I, I, I want to, I, I'd like to share with the audience uh, some, some, some ideas and, and because I, I really think there's a huge potential uh, behind this issue of, uh, of political work. 
first, I, I think it is worth noting that um, uh, this uh, issue of political work in India uh, uh, takes place in a context where, according to official statistics, Indian women, uh, the engagement of women, uh, Indian women in paid uh, work is steadily declining. It was already very low, uh, but it is, it is constantly declining. I mean, according to official statistics, around one third of Indian women were engaged in paid work in the early 80s, compared to less than 20% today. Well, there is probably an underestimation of this, but it is clear that the uh, overall trend is downward. No? Uh, now, many explanations have been given, uh, I'm not going to enter into detail, uh, but, but I think we have to seriously consider the increasing amount of time that working class women have to spend on this issue of political work. I mean, you describe this with great finesse. I mean, it's like time consuming, it's repetitive, it's routine. When women have to wait uh, several hours a day to get water, then to go to a demonstration to get the electricity turned off, then to sit in uh, to get their paper uh, regularized, then again to wait at the ration shop to get some food and so forth. Uh, I mean, what time is left for them to engage in paid work? Uh, is it a routine? Uh, is it time consuming? It, it is also unpredictable. Uh, you have to be there at the right time which makes it difficult to project into any other regular uh, activity. Um, and, and I mean, uh, as some of you know, or many of you, maybe, or maybe all of you know, I mean, feminist research has constantly questioned the meaning of work and, and, and the need for a broader view of work, both paid and unpaid, visible and invisible. Fortunately, much progress has been made to broaden the category of work, and domestic work, care work, social reproduction work. Uh, Christine was talking about it. But what your work show, uh, Calvary show implicitly uh, is that political work is a category in itself that must be considered uh, seriously. Um, and, 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 and as we've been discussing already uh, uh, by the past, uh, yeah, I mean, this, it is not true only in, in, in for the human poor, it's true everywhere and, in, 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 and everywhere in the world. Um, and I think it's a crucial component of the current Sorry, Professor Guerra, I think. Oh, yeah, can... yeah. yeah. I, I don't know why my the mic was off. So, oh. um, so I don't know when it, it stopped. Well, I, I, I don't think. You were making a point on how it's not just a matter for the urban poor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What I was saying is that it seems to be that it is, it is, it is uh, all over the place and all over the world. And that it, it should be uh, considered seriously also because it's a, it seems to me to be uh, a fundamental part of present form of, accumula of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, regime of accumulation. I mean, in many countries all over the world, and even if, if this is to varying degrees, we have a combination of neoliberal policies based on the impunity of private capital, the regulation, lower or no taxation, in combination with social, so-called social policies uh, in the form of social safety nets and the promise of basic rights. Mm -hmm. Also in combination with NGOs, trade union uh, association, which are, which are also there to, to complement the, the, the failures of private capital to, to, to ensure the social reproduction of workers. What you show is that those, social, so, so those uh, uh, basic rights are, are not universal, but must be deserved. I mean, uh, uh, only the poor and women in this case who perform political work are entitled to them. And you, you write quite rightly, page at the very beginning, I quote, one is therefore poor, not because of how much one earns, one is poor because one lives in poorly built neighborhoods, spends immense time and effort accessing even basic services, is constrained to make do with poor education and health facilities. Um, and and uh, yeah, for, for, for me, uh, uh, it is crucial, no? two things. Uh, 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 the book already do, does a lot on this, and I think it might be worth considering this for future, uh, for avenue of for future work and piece de recherche, as, as Christine was saying. First, um, um, uh, the, the, the multiple facets of this political work, you already give a lot. I mean, emotional work, paperwork, which I find fascinating, especially when we know that most of these women are illiterate. I think here it would be useful to pursue the analysis and to see the kind of know-how and, and, and savoir-être that political work supposes. I guess a very good knowledge of the administrative maze, 
uh, an ability to identify uh, difficulties and, and priorities, uh, deciding about, about the most efficient repertoires of action. For, in, for instance, should it be rather mass demonstration or, or, or personal bargaining with specific political leaders? Here you, you have very specific skills that people have to elaborate to, to decide about the, 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 the right repertoire of action. Identifying, identifying windows of opportunities and with whom and how to negotiate. Um, you, you, you insist on waiting with a couple of pages devoted to this and, 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 and very convincingly you, you tell us that the, those urban poor are, are in a permanent situation of waiting. I guess that political work also involves a specific capacity to wait in front of politicians, in front of officials, which also require, I guess, to show deference, submission, um, and, and, and which is also part of the skills that people have to, to perform to, to, to do this political work efficiently. I guess there is also, there is also a strong component of relational work. I mean, uh, I mean negotiating, talking, coaxing, uh, and more broadly, uh, building and, and maintaining good uh, 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 social relations. No? Which also raised the question, who is able to perform this work? I guess people don't have the choice. All of them have to engage into that to, to, to be eligible to, 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 to basic rights. But, but, but I guess that some of them are, are, are more skilled than others. You know, who? And, and, and who, who is excluded? I mean, uh, 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 what is... Uh, uh, I get this issue of political work is so important that it might also be interesting to see who is who 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 is able to perform this, who is not. Um, and and maybe to just to finish, uh, yeah, I think the, the the consequences. Let me get back to the, to the, the why I think it's so important. Um, I mean, I, I was mentioning this quickly, but let me come back to this as a conclusion. Uh, what are the consequences, both for the, 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 the at, at the level of private capital? I mean, this political work is instrumental in ensuring the social reproduction of workers, and thus indirectly subsidize private capital, which can afford to pay very low wages without this affecting the productivity of, of the labor force. There are also strong consequences for the state, since in fact this political work has the effect of making sure somehow that the social state work. This political work conditions the very existence and legitimacy of the social state. Um, so you, 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 without this political work, what, what, could, what one could fear an explosion of, of, of the laboring classes. So it's in fact a, a crucial component of, of, of a kind of informal democracy. No? Um, which also raise another aspect, which is uh, something which has been observed also, uh, Christine was talking about it uh, all over the, in many parts of, of the world, and, and not only for the human poor, but in, in environmental issues, uh, in, in, in new forms of unionism, the feminization of political struggle. You know? For a long time, it was thought that political struggle were a male privilege, women being confined to the private space, Feminist history has shown that it was completely wrong. But what seems to be a new reality is that increasingly women are in the majority in many struggles. And what does this mean? I mean, this is, this is very strong consequences. No? So I, I, there is much more to the book, uh, uh, but given the limited time I had, I limited myself to highlight this question of political work, which I find crucial. Uh, because I, it seems to me that it is at the heart of the current political and, and economic regimes. Um, at the heart of the sexual division of labor and, and at also at the heart of, of the renewal of, of patriarchy and this well beyond India. So thank you, Kavari, for this fascinating and, and, and refreshing work and, and really uh, congratulations for, for, for all this. And I really hope we will have uh, opportunities of collaboration in the, in the future. Yeah, thanks. Thank you, Dr. Guerra. I'm so sorry that I've had to, you know, keep a time and restrict. I know there's lots to be discussed and we could go on and on. Sorry, Professor Rajkumar, you have your hand. You've raised your hand. Yeah, but uh, maybe I have a question or a comment, but uh, in the course of your uh, moderation, I'll tell, I'll, I'll raise it whenever you get an opportunity. You can go ahead now because I was just about to summarize all the points that were raised. Okay, good. Well, uh, Kaveri, I just uh, say, I mean, you know, one of the challenges of uh, judicial interventions on this matter, right from the Olga Tellis 1985 case uh, from Bombay to even yesterday's case in which the Supreme Court of India observed in the Community Kitchens uh, policy case, uh, and this is yesterday, the Chief Justice uh, of India observing 
that uh, welfare state has to ensure no one dies of hunger, quote unquote. Um, I want to say that you know there's something very, very uniquely situated in the Indian democracy, where one would like to believe that um, elect electoral democracies are better suited to respond to the marginalized, to the disempowered, as to a large extent, they indeed form political constituencies and they are much more sensitive to the aspirations of those people. And uh, while, uh, you know, uh, democratic institutions such as courts, by virtue of the kind of people who end up accessing these courts, are much more sympathetic to middle class uh, needs and aspirations. But um, in our country, despite the fact that uh, we have uh, uh, electoral democracy, constitutional democracy, the fact is, it's to a large extent, courts are driving this agenda, and uh, albeit in a rather ineffective manner. Uh, and these things acquire a certain type of uh, attention for a period of time, uh, and then they have a tendency to just get into the margins. So my question to you is that, are democracies even more difficultly placed when it comes to, uh, you know, uh, responding to the needs and aspirations of the marginalized? Okay. Thank you, Professor Rajkumar. I will quickly sum up the comments. I'll try my best to cover lots for you to comment on. So uh, this idea of margins, marginalization, it's geographical, it's economic, it's political, it's of course social and environmental. And it's there across different cities. In uh, Delhi, we've seen it not just in low-lying areas, in Bhavana and Bhalaswa, they are right next to landfills. So the exposure to environmental uh, factors affecting health is much more for people in these rehabilitation societies. So that compromises health. And this idea of language in itself, and uh, I completely agree, you know, the way you present theory, empirical data, and there is this empathy and softness in your work. And I would really, I want, I would love to hear what motivated you to work, take this up and what guided the way, A, language, the way you used it, and we, you mentioned, you know, how media covers the right to livelihood and how there is a, there are, there's a paucity of maids and drivers and the perspective is a very from the middle class families, but you've shifted it and you're gazing, for, as it was pointed out, from the affected people, the urban poor, and which is why the title In Search of Home in itself, it's, it's a, you've changed the stand. And language in itself, and Professor Appadurai has been disconnected. He pointed out the Islamic roots of the term right and haq and language. There is power in language in itself. It has the power to exclude and thus marginalize. And the way you've used language in your book was, uh, it's, it's very intriguing and it's, it's very it's soft. Uh, the role of gender, emotion, and uh, Time, poverty, political work. Yes, I completely agree. Though, how do we define work? Uh, if the issue of time poverty is not just limited to urban poor, the amount of time spent in getting justice, emotional and political work, waiting time. Uh, thank you for bringing in camps. We have a camp right outside JGU. It's been there for almost 10 years now if more than a year now, and uh, the idea of violence. And again, how do we define violence? Uh, gay citizenship. So uh, Kaveri, I'm going to hand it over to you. I'm sorry, we are running out of time. Yeah, so I will probably take up the points in a little bit, you know, not from speaker to speaker, but in terms of themes. And I'm very glad that uh, Professor Rajkumar asked me this question on democracies. And that has been, uh, you know, one of the most important questions in this book is uh, the kind of dependency mechanisms between uh, political representatives, the clientelism of the poor, where the poor are in a certain sense dependent on political representatives. And one can also see that this dependency is also reinforced in the manner in which uh, governance takes place at the lowest level. 
meaning that there is, uh, it is in the interest of the political representatives to keep the poor where they are. And that has, uh, you know, uh, though I'm dealing now, uh, you know, here I want to sort of, you know, note that this is a, about rehabilitation areas and these are, this is legal housing for the urban poor. These, these are not even slums, you know, and uh, uh, therefore it, it, it uh, goes without saying that there is a certain expectation that the poor have that they finally have achieved citizenship uh, after a long period of time. And then they discover that the manner in which that they, they deal with these representatives continues to be in this mode of dependency. Uh, there is a permanence of dependency there. And, and in a sense, I think I, I would accept uh, your reflection that perhaps uh, this is a result of democracy, but also the result of different levels of democracy, being that local governance at the lowest levels uh, is what gains the most from these kind of uh, relationships. And it is important for these people to stay poor so that uh, the electoral needs of the representatives are uh, in a certain sense met. And therefore my work has been extremely critical of, of this kind of relationship. There's a lot of theoretical material which sort of talks about it in a rather emancipatory manner that the poor are able to demand and get what they want at the local governance level. Yes, uh, only mm -hmm. so far and no further. So my ethnography shows in a certain sense that there are a lot of limits to this. And this is uh, very troubling uh, and perhaps also a symptom of uh, democratic governance uh, as well as uh, decentralized governance in India. Uh, now I want to link this to the uh, comment that Professor Apadurai uh, made on Huck and uh, the use of language. And, and I'm very glad uh, that he uh, contributed to, to sort of opening up the etymology and also showing us a paradox that, did, that this actually is, you know, comes from an Islamic term. Uh, the, the word right itself uh, uh, emerges uh, from that, uh, uh, you know, from that uh, religion in a certain sense. And uh, uh, here, I think the manner in which the poor conceive of rights, and this brings me, uh, brings me to the concluding part of my book, where I discuss the manner in which the poor think about Huck. And I'm so glad that he did it because he said, he talked about the daily uh, uh, language of rights, right? And there is a difference in, in the manner in which people talk about Hakku and the way we talk about human rights mm -hmm. in a certain sense. And it's a different context. It's a different way of looking at it. Um, and what I saw at the local level was that it was far more normative. It was in terms of, okay, somebody else got something and therefore I have a right to it. And not in terms of human rights or the uni you know, uh, universal declaration of human rights or even rights under the constitution. So there is a difference in the manner in which we talk about rights in a legal sense of the term and the manner in which people appropriate terms like haku and use it in their uh, daily life. So this brings me to your comment again on language. Uh, Kriti, I'm, uh, you know, I must say that, uh, you know, we just only recently met due to the talk and I'm quite happy to have these conversations with you because we have a lot uh, to exchange on our field work. Um, uh, you are right that uh, perhaps the softness comes from two things and Christine mentioned it, uh, that I spent five years um, doing longitudinal, uh, doing what I call a longitudinal ethnography, um, because I was interviewing the same set of people each time I arrived on the field. Uh, so it was 50 families uh, with whom I had grown comfortable and I had uh, pretty much become part of the you know, background, uh, so much so that in 2015, they wouldn't even notice when I came into their house or you know walked into their street. There would be no interest. Mm -hmm. So uh, there is that uh, perhaps that proximity and that comfort, uh, and the ability to also think about things in the way they think about things, 
rather than the way I think about things. And I discussed this in the chapter on, for example, documents. As a lawyer, one either has a, mm -hmm. uh, you know, correct document or one has a fake document. We distinguish origin. And the manner in which people used it on the ground was very different. Fake documents actually, actually got them a lot of things. Uh, and so, uh, so many of these experiences where I would say, you know, no, this is not right. This is not the correct document. And two years after that, somebody would get an allotment because of a fake document uh, made me realize that, you know, the way I'm looking at things is perhaps not uh, the right way. A second response is because uh, uh, perhaps also my, my interest in poverty is because I lived across a slum. I lived in a new middle-class neighborhood in South Bangalore in Jainagar in those days, uh, which was very new. Now, is, now it is, of course, a very uh, busy part of the city. And it is in those days, that was the periphery of the city. And so, uh, you know, my own experiences growing up with children in the neighborhood they were, where there were not too many other children to play with, where we would play with children from the slum uh, because uh, there was nobody else. You know, there were only one or two other people and you had to play a game and you had to have them there. So there's some amount of perhaps a, a comfort and a proximity uh, because of my childhood uh, experiences as well, which perhaps comes forth in my, uh, in the manner in which I, I quite at ease with, uh, with urban poor uh, families. And I don't find myself out of place. Um, I'm quite comfortable in, in those environments. Uh, I would like to now go to Christine versus, uh, you know, one of the questions that she asked is um, uh, one, one comment that she made is in terms of the politicization of social reproduction. And here I have some thoughts to offer that when we talk about social reproduction, it's a huge bucket in which you bring in everything. Everything that women do within their houses and sometimes in their balconies or uh, in their neighborhoods comes within this definition. So much so that you also include, for instance, subs subsistence uh, agriculture, right? Subsistence cultivation, subsistence uh, production of food. Uh, and I find that bucket quite large. It's quite large and quite unwieldy. And I wonder if it is really uh, conceptually, if, if it is really very useful to sort of think of this as a politicization of social reproduction, or if we should think about it in, in a different way. And here I would like to uh, connect with Isabel's point um, on political work. And when I was looking at this, what I felt was that when we traditionally think about work, we think about paid work. And we do not consider all of the work that goes into survival as work. Uh, even in research and in, uh, you know, in academic work on social movements, as well as um, everyday politics, for instance, and everyday struggles of the urban poor, uh, as well as informal uh, settlements, uh, the manner in which this is looked at is in terms of uh, resistance to the state, in terms of protests, in terms of struggles, but never as work. Uh, and it fascinated me, as, as Isabel said, the amount of time women spend on this kind of work. And it's not just uh, negotiating for water, sanitation, and electricity, but it's also uh, keeping an eye on the ration shop and ensuring that the ration shop opens on time, complaining to the right authorities if it didn't open. So all kinds of welfare mechanisms, you know, making sure that they spend time to improve the local school nearby, fighting for one and a half years to have two classrooms added to the private, you know, primary uh, government primary school. And then after those one and a half years of fighting for, for the funding, then fighting another, another one year to get the government acceptances and clearances to build those classrooms. So it's, it's an immense amount of energy and time that women sped, uh, spend. And it's, you're absolutely right. It's, it's not all women who do that. It's only certain women who, don't, who, are not, uh, who do not have little children, who have grown up children, and who have the time to be able to spend, to it, spend on it. But also women who decide that they do not want to take up paid work and they substitute paid work with this form of work because they find this uh, far more remunerative. 
because for them, if they do not have a house, they do not have, uh, they cannot imagine anything else. That is the very basic requirement. And so they feel uh, many women actually rationalize this in terms of a better investment to make in terms of time, effort, uh, and uh, uh, skills um, as against working on uh, paid work. Mm -hmm. This is something we've been discussing for a long time and we are now working together uh, on an article on this topic. So I just want to also uh, sort of reassure uh, Professor Rajkumar that there, there will be a few Scopus in, uh, indexed articles from this book. That was the very point of writing this book in the first place to sort of be able to put it together and then uh, publish it separately uh, with a deeper conceptual uh, engagement. Uh, but I want to now once again come back to the question of law and here uh, Veronique uh, talked about a judgment uh, that is the Sudama case, if I'm right, Veronique, it's in, uh, in Delhi. And there are several other cases. And here again, I think I will take a middle path to say that, uh, that there is some possibility because these judgments are used by the urban poor to sort of get at least a little more from the state. But as you know, uh, and, and your work has actually you know, motivated a lot of my analysis on law and the urban poor, uh, these are not fundamental rights. There is no fundamental right to housing. And therefore, there are also limitations to, uh, to the exercise of these rights. And even in terms of Olga Tellis, for instance, we see how even after that judgment, the poor land up, uh, uh, you know, a, a good part of that, uh, those pavement dwellers don't even get a right to that housing. And those who do uh, are still made to wait for several years and very few finally get housing and once again thrown away uh, in the peripheries of the city. So I think that, you know, I'm quite so much so in, in the middle path, I believe law is very helpful, but in a certain sense, it also is very, very uh, limiting. Uh, so I think I've said uh, a lot on, uh, on a little on, uh, you know, from all the comments, but you've said a lot more, and I will not be able to respond to everything. Um, uh, now I would like to sort of, you know, go down to the vote of thanks because we are well over time. Uh, so just to say a book normally feels like the culmination of things. It normally feels like the end. But here, after your comments, thank you very much. I, I'd like to thank all of you uh, for such wonderful comments. And I've scribbled all of them down in my notebook. Um, it now feels like the beginning rather than the end. Uh, I would now like to thank each one of you uh, individually. My deepest gratitude to Professor Appa Durai foremost for having accepted this invitation, having made it here, uh, and having said such wonderful things about my book. Your comments are precious, and it will help me rethink, reflect my uh, on my own approach uh, to this uh, uh, to this uh, uh, issue of politics of the poor. Um, Christine, my deepest gratitude uh, for the conviction you've had in me, uh, even at times when I've not had it, you know, I felt that uh, I could not do it. You were always quite confident that I could do this. Uh, I owe you a lot and, uh, and I'm, I'm really very happy to have the, the best guide, to have had the best guide, PhD guide in the world. Thank you very much. Uh, Veronique, I thank you for your, uh, you know, large heartedness, but most importantly, your work, your impeccable, um, you know, uh, empirical work, which inspired me when I started out this research. Uh, and I realized that there were very few people who were writing on law and the urban poor uh, to look at the legal aspects as well as the urban governance aspects to it. And I thank you deeply for that, for having read the entire book even before it was out and for having endorsed it. Thank you very, very much. Uh, finally, but uh, you know, most importantly, uh, Isabel, you also read the entire book. Thank you so much. And uh, we have been discussing uh, parts of these chapters when they were still in draft and we are working together now, hopefully on the concept of uh, political work, we will be able to come out with something a little deeper uh, on it, uh, which includes not just my fieldwork, but also Isabel's very rich fieldwork in uh, Tamil Nadu. 
and here i must refer to uh, you know the field researcher santosh kumar and uh, uh, venkata uh, and their impeccable research which is also very very inspiring and i hope that we can use this research to sort of strengthen uh, this concept of political work and to think of this as not just as politics but as work itself uh, finally kriti i you know i am really glad to have bumped into you thank you very much <laughs> and and i'm so happy to talk to you each time we talk about this i you know it incites new reflections um, the questions you ask are very very provoking and very uh, uh, very crucial to help me also improve uh, the way i look at this thank you very much um, i am sincerely grateful to uh, professor uh, rajkumar uh, the vice chancellor of jindal global university as i said earlier i started this in 2017 and i think i was able to write it only because i am in jju and not elsewhere uh, and because i am uh, i work with dean sudarshan <laughs> and not someone else uh dean sudarshan i must uh, say that i'm really really uh, grateful for your uh, unflinching support uh, to research and to writing and most importantly i must say uh, that it is really your kindness your generosity uh, your humanity which is so inspiring uh, without you i i think this kind of activity would not be very easy to uh, undertake thank you very much um finally uh, you know my thanks to the entire administrative team in jju and i will name specific people here not everybody and i know i will miss a few people but i must say that they are the backbone of uh, jindal global university uh i thank everybody all of them uh, with with my uh, uh, you know with sincerity uh, but here i would my gratitude to lalit uh, mohan singh nepalia uh, nepolia uh, sorry lalit i have called you at very weird times for very weird <laughs> queries and questions uh, but thank you very much for the patience you have shown me the uh, the amazing organization of this uh, event thank you very much i'm sincerely thankful to the kindness and the generosity of manimala our executive officer uh, who stands by us through thick and thin um uh, my thanks to the it team uh, for you know for doing all of that back organization behind the curtains organization which allows us to have this live stream today in youtube um i know a few of them personally uh, and they have uh, you know they have been extremely uh, helpful and always there to help us out mm -hmm. thank you very much for making all of this possible uh a thanks to the communications team and here i must thank anju mohan as well as pratiksha rana who have done a great job of disseminating uh information on both the launch as well as the book my deepest gratitude to all of you thank you very much thanks thank you thank you and congratulations once again thanks and this was wonderful i think like professor sudarshan said this is uh, i'm going to keep referring to this conversation for my phd application so thank you so much to all the guest speakers this was wonderful thank you thanks so